Hey guys, so this is a review video for quiz two in unit two. If it gets too long, I'll make it a two-parter, but I will cover most of the items that are going to be on the quiz, and if I don't get into detail about something, I'll specify that in this video. So without further ado, here we go. Uh, first topic we want to talk about, again, uh, I should have specified that this quiz roughly covers China under Mao. Uh, so starting with the year 1949 up to actually slightly past Mao's death because we're also going to include the one-child policy and its enforcement and consequences. And we will also talk a little bit about minorities in China, but we're actually going over that in class on Thursday and Friday. So I'm not really going to include much about that in this video. So let's get started in 1949, right? What are Mao's goals for China when he takes over? So um, the first bullet point is more or less summarizing those goals. One of the most important priorities and one of the most impactful was his land redistribution program, right? So what he ended up uh, literally doing was getting rid of China's landlords. And when I say getting rid of, I mean literally. About 700,000 people were killed. They were former members of the Kuomintang, former landlords. Um, and when they, were, when they were purged, their property was redistributed among the peasantry, which is what this poster is actually showing here. Uh, forgive me, because that's rather redundant. I also say equal distribution of property here. But another major goal of Mao's was to achieve more gender equality. And uh, I'm skipping around, but he also wanted to uh, make sure that everyone could read. And that's why I put this poster here. I just think that that sort of summarizes both these ideas, because this is a girl teaching her mother how to read sort of promoting both gender equality and universal literacy. But with that said, one of the reasons why everyone, uh, why rather Mao wanted everyone to be able to read was so that everyone could read his ideas. We're not talking about the freedom to read the New York Times or anything like that. Lastly, Mao really wanted China to catch up with the West and we'll talk about his five year plan to summarize that. Okay, like I was just saying, it's really important for Mao to brainwash his citizens to be able to accomplish these policy goals. Again, one of the reasons why he wanted everyone to be able to read. And even some of these ideas that are liberating in some way, like more women's rights, were also an attempt to achieve more total control over the Chinese population. But we'll get to that later. Um, so I already sort of covered this, but again, his top priority was land redistribution. And this is, yes, it's not everyone, but this is a huge number. I mean, think about it. The population of the U.S. is what, 333 million people, something like that, 350? Um, so that's like two-thirds of the entire population of the U.S. today that got land in this program. So that's kind of significant. If you remember in class we read this article, you can totally go back on the slide and read it again, or I think you have a handout of it. Um, and maybe you want to review some of these questions. But let's talk a little bit about the 100 Flowers campaign because that's what that article was about. So if you remember the origin of this event, the reason why it's called that is because Mao literally said, let 100 flowers bloom, let 100 schools of thought contain. And what he meant by this is you're free to say whatever you want about the government, right? You're free to critique communist ideas, right? But that seems sort of counterintuitive to Mao's agenda. And that's absolutely right. So why was this happening? If you were an intellectual leading up to 1949, when the People's Republic of China was established, you experienced a huge shock. Your ideas were not necessarily welcome in a much more collective society. You were no longer really free to freely think in Mao's China. So a lot of intellectuals didn't really feel like they had a place within the Communist Party. So Mao was sort of trying to cater towards that feeling of disillusionment that the intellectual class felt. But there's more to it than that. You may remember that in class we talked about how Mao also sort of was setting a trap for any dissidents in communist China. If someone did post something critical of the Communist Party on the democracy while in Beijing, then that could be traced back to them. And then the punishment, of course, 
was literally purging, right? So the reaction to the 100 Flowers campaign, which was quite short-lived, was something called the anti rightist campaign. So if you were seen as an enemy of Mao, you were labeled a rightist, and you ended up going to a re-education camp or disappearing and never to be heard from again, right? So the reason why this is so important, and if you remember the title of the article, the silence, the silence was the anti rightist campaign. The fact that people were no longer able to speak because the 100 Flowers campaign turned out to be a farce meant that what followed, the Great Leap Forward, it's going to be very difficult to really fully realize the extent of the failures of the Great Leap Forward because no one is really willing or able to criticize it. And furthermore, before the plan even occurs, before the Great Leap Forward even is executed, no one really feels comfortable crit critiquing it, saying, oh, that's a bad idea, right? So that's really, really significant. Okay, moving forward. Remember, we analyzed propaganda. You might want to check out these posters again. Think, Look for symbols, look for colors, right? Remember that these are all pieces of propaganda for the Great Leap Forward. We have more to come for the Cultural Revolution and the One Child Policy. We read this piece because we wanted to make sure that we could relate it all back to human rights, so maybe check that back out. Definitely consider the questions we discussed. All right. And of course, it all goes back to this idea of ind individual versus collective human rights. Why does it matter that we see in many of these pieces of propaganda, right, and many of Mao's policy goals, that it seems like the group and the country as a whole is prioritized over the individual. And what better example of that than collective farming, which is what we're about to talk about. But before we get there, let's also talk about Mao's first five-year plan, so before the Great Leap Forward. Um, and this goes back to Mao's policy goals, which we already talked about, right? What Mao was attempting to do here was surpass the West in industrial production, or at the very least, catch up to the West to begin with. It's impossible to give it a specific figure, but China was approximately 100 years behind the West in terms of modernization and industrial production. So what they were attempting to do was launch a Soviet-style five-year plan to catch China up with the West at that point. And you can see that they actually, in many instances, exceeded their production plans. However, when we shift our focus from industrial production also to agricultural production, we're gonna see more mixed results. So the Great Leap Forward was arguably a much more ambitious plan than Mao's first five-year plan. The idea was still industrial, partially, right? They not only, again, wanted to catch up to the West, but this time they wanted to surpass the West. Um, it was yet another five-year plan in that regard, right? They were definitely copying the Soviets, and uh, you know, literally with the terminology. Um, and the government at least claims that they actually not only met that goal, but they exceeded that goal. But I put that in parentheses because that's a claim, not necessarily a fact. Uh, but the more important part of the Great Leap Forward was the agricultural collectivization plan. So an uh, agricultural collective is sort of what it sounds like. Instead of farming individually, right, on your own little privately owned plot of land, you live on what's called a commune, which is basically a huge group style of living. You sleep in a dormitory, you eat together in a huge mess hall, your children go to the same daycare which was provided by the commune so you could go to work and have someone else watch your kids. Your kids would go to school at the commune and read about Mel, right? Do military training, literally. Um, so everything was together. Some of these communes literally eliminated money and currency in an effort to at least appear to be purely egalitarian. Um, another really important part beyond just agricultural production um, was the cultivation, or cultivation is the wrong word, the mass production of steel, right? And I encourage you to re-watch this video if you guys want. It's really helpful. Um, so go to slide 97 and check that out. But these backyard furnaces were literally um, little steel furnaces, you can see them here too, that people had in their backyards. They would take every piece of, um, oh gosh, why am I blanking on what material you use to make steel? Iron? 
I don't know, coal, forgive me. It's not my area of expertise. But they would gather these, these materials together, smelt them, and make steel out of it. Which seems like a pretty cool idea, but the problem was that it wasn't the best quality, and so often it was rendered useless. But it was seen as a very empowering moment for a lot of people working in the communes, because it sort of lined up with this Marxist ideology or Marxist mentality of workers literally owning the means of their production. In other words, it meant that they sort of felt like they had ownership over the product that they were making. Whereas in a capitalist society, if you're the working class, you're working, you're laboring, you're using your hands, and it's a capitalist, it's the person who owns the business or the person who manages the business that's making most of the money, right? But it's the reverse here with the backyard furnaces. So the idea was really inspiring and people got right on board. It was just the product was not really the highest quality. Um, but the most important upshot or um, takeaway of the Great Leap Forward was the fact that agricultural collectivization failed miserably. And that wasn't just because the government uh, placed unrealistic quotas on the communes. Some of it was due to natural disaster. There was a huge drought um, in another part of the country. I want to say that there actually was, there was flooding in certain parts of the country, drought in other parts of the country, right? So ultimately it was partially due to natural disaster, um, but also many people just literally starved to death because they did not get to keep the food that they cultivated it was taken by the state. That's another key part of communism, as you guys know, right? The state owns everything. And so many times it was the farmers themselves that were not able to feed themselves. But they didn't only die just due to starvation. Also, we have evidence to suggest, and the numbers are disputed based on the sources, but we have other numbers to suggest that if you, you know, went against sort of the approach of the Great Leap Forward, if you were caught stealing food, um, you could also get tortured, executed, etc. So Western sources estimate that at least 45 million people were killed um, or died rather during the Great Leap Forward and the Great Famine. Um, some sources, uh, I believe the Chinese government figure is closer to 20 million. So again, it's an interesting uh, example of where historians disagree. Okay, check out this video. Um, we just watched a quick clip in class, but if you're really into this stuff, you should watch the whole thing. It's about a half an hour long. Okay, cool. How about we do a part two for the Cultural Revolution just to make this easier to handle? So I'm going to take a quick pause and we'll do the Cultural Revolution next. So stay tuned.